Welcome everybody to today's program. I'm Deborah Diamond. I'm the curator here of South and Southeast Asian Art and one of the trio of curators who worked on the exhibition Encountering the Buddha. And we're all here very grateful to um, Alice Kandel, who gave the museum in 2011 some 200 objects that constitute the shrine room inside the exhibition, and to the Robert H. and Ho Foundation, who made the entire exhibition and today's program possible, and especially to art historian Melissa Kieran and artist Gonkar Gyatso, who will be speaking today from different perspectives about Tibetan Buddhist shrines. So since this relates to the shrine room that's on exhibit, uh, right back there, I wanted to tell you uh, what our goals were when we acquired it. And one of them was to find, to find a different way to exhibit um, objects, a Asian artworks. Um, we had typically shown them here, always in vitrines, isolated, kind of cold, imprisoned, um, which is di distorting in its own way. And by grouping the objects in a way that was liturgically correct, even though the shrine room was put together in New York rather than um, in the Himalayas, by putting the objects together in a way that was liturgically correct and aesthetically correct, uh, we thought we could create a different kind of learning and an emotional uh, connection that would be different from the kind of detached aesthetic appreciation that one is supposed to have from the museum vitrine aesthetic as sort of set up by Kant and other philosophers. Um, we also thought the shrine would, we also thought we would, we would keep contextualizing the shrine and telling different stories about it. So we created, for example, uh, this app, Sacred Spaces, that's outside the shrine, or you can put it on your iPhone, that includes information about those objects on view, but also an entire typology of all the different kinds of diverse shrines there are on the Tibetan plateau and how they're used through photographs and words and videos. Um, and each time we install the shrine, we work with a scholar and a monk to sort of get more knowledge here. And we also have programs about them. So today's program um, includes Gonkar Gyatso, who is arguably, no certainly, the most important living Tibetan uh, artist today um, in the d global diaspora sense, and Melissa Kieran, who is a professor of art history and religion at Washington and Lee University. She has a degree from Harvard Divinity School, as well as art history from the University of Pennsylvania. And her specialties include Tibetan Buddhist shrines, uh, religious praxis, um, South Asian art, cultural memory, and her most recent book from 2015 is about Buddhist practice. Um, with that, Melissa, you want to come up here and begin the program? Thank you. Here she is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you think, can you hear me if I just project? Is this okay? No, you need this for that. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Deborah. It's fabulous to be here. Um, Deborah and I have been talking about shrines for several years, um, certainly in relation to the shrine installation here. Uh, so very grateful to be able to be here today and also incredibly grateful to and indebted to Gonkar Gyatso. Um, he and I have been in conversations for a good two years now about shrines and what they mean to us. Um, me in terms of my academic research and he is interested in um, both cultural and artistic expressions and understandings of shrines um, within Tibet uh, and outside of Tibet and the Tibetan diaspora. So uh, we have had um, uh, th this whole experience and the show that is up now in Lexington, Virginia, which you'll, you'll um, hear more about in a minute. Um, that show is called, it's an installation, and it's called Buddha's Picnic. And it's Gunkar Gyatso's um, examination and um, artistic play around concepts of the shrine, but also picnicking. 
Um, so we'll come to that in a minute. It seemed as though in our discussions about this talk and how we might present the information, um, Gunkar felt it was necessary for you to get um, a sense of, of what shrines are within the Tibetan context. Um, and then from there, we'll look quickly at uh, museum shrines, how they're created in the museum context. And then we'll look uh, to Gonkar's work. I've got some images here. Um, and he'll have uh, images for us to consider as well. So um, the most important thing to take away from today's talk is that shrines are everywhere. They're absolutely ubiquitous in Tibetan culture, and not just Buddhist culture, right? We have also a bon tradition, an religious, uh, indigenous religious tradition of Tibet. And um, so shrines are a wonderful expression of um, a devotee's relationship to the divine. In some ways, that's, that's a very quick and uh, abbreviated form of understanding what can be a very complicated uh, construction. So um, we have lots of images and types of shrines. Uh, this was in a monastery in uh, uh, Nartang in central Tibet. This is a shrine that you see in a restaurant, a cafe in Kathmandu. We're talking about different places and countries because we are talking about Tibetan exile, right? So Tibetan cultures exist beyond Tibet in the Tibetan Autonomous Region, but we see it in Nepal, uh, experiences in exile in Nepal, in India, and of course the Western world as well. Ah, the clothing store. Uh, and the person taking these images and writing about them is a student, Tashi uh, Diki, who's a student at UVA. Uh, I've collaborated with UVA to create a much larger Tibetan shrine project. So we're uh, going through this um, systematic documentation of different types of shrines. Um, and she got one here at a clothing store. This is a nun's personal shrine in a village called Tagon. And these are some details of some of the offerings that you find at shrines. This is another nun's uh, personal uh, shrine in, again, the same village of Tagum. And this is back in Kathmandu, Nepal. And uh, Gyanse Monastery in central Tibet. So all of these images, though abbreviated, give you a sense of the diverse types of shrines that we can find and their locations. Um, Though there are so many types of shrines, from the very simple with soda bottles and just one devotional image, uh, to something much more complex, such as what we see at Gyanse, um, the function still stays the same. So the forms can be multivarious, but the function is quite singular. Um, it is a way, it's a site where the devotee can interact with the divine with her divinity, his divinity, um, by providing, giving an offering. And doing so, sorry, in doing so, there is um, an exchange that happens, right? You're giving these votive offerings um, at this designated site, and um, you're asking for forgiveness, for, for, for protection, uh, for guidance of some sort, right? It is this direct, unmediated communication that the shrine allows. Um, and that's one of the reasons that makes them so intriguing because they're so idiosyncratic. But it's also one of the things that makes them incredibly difficult to study from, say, a traditional art historical perspective, right? Where we look at clear categories of style, uh, periodization, etc. Shrines confuse all of that and also bring in mass-produced imagery as well. Um, what I'll also say is that shrines, you know, are not just something that we find in Tibet, right? They, this is a trans-regional, uh, pan-religious uh, expression of communication and communion between devotee and divine. Uh, we see it within the Christian tradition, for instance, in Ireland um, at St. Uh, Brandon's Rag Tree, where people make offerings um, and votive offerings asking for some sort of healing in response. Um, I can't help but pair a close-up of St. Brennan's um, tree with a close-up of an image that comes from Samye Monastery, the first monastery in Tibet, 
um, votive offerings there. Both, this is on, appended to the tree. This, these are appended to the um, wooden pillar. So um, these offerings are, as I said, very diverse. You have bracelets, hair ties, baby bottles. Uh, devotional photographs, amulet boxes, mortuary tablets, these are called satsa. They are, each object, and this is what's so fascinating, is that each object really tells a story, but that story remains silent, right? Because it is from the devotee who picks, who chooses to give this baby bottle. Why? Is it about a sickness? Is it about a death? Is it a memorializing? What's happening? We don't know, and that's also why it's so intriguing and so compelling, I think, for us to um, be at these sites, to look at these traces of human engagement. It's very powerful and compelling. Um, and so, and this is another example. And what we see here, um, this is at, uh, uh, not Nartang, Moor, Moor Monastery, also in central Tibet. Um, what we see is this pillar with a ton of offerings added to it. So we're talking about accreted surfaces, right? And in the background, we also have the, quote, more rarefied uh, sculpture and tanka paintings that you would see here uh, in the background. So it's a combination, a mashup of uh, different types of imagery. It's not all just the pristine, beautiful stuff, right? It's all sorts of things that are layered, um, and, and that's the point, that you add your offering to a place that has been recognized as a potent place to make an offering. And this is uh, Gyanse. So, and you can see the devotional pictures here in the background. You see the butter uh, torma here. Um, and it's always interesting then for me to sort of come from these layered, accreted um, surfaces of the shrine when they're really functioning um, to then more museum, very beautiful, pristine constructions of the shrine. Um, as Deborah said, the shrine here had been uh, well documented and we had been talking about the ways of inflecting or nuancing uh, the shrine presentation as it appears here now uh, with other information so that people could get a sense of how, the, how this is a construction, um, but it is a didactic one. It gives us information about uh, shrines, the types of images, as, as Deborah said, a monk is involved in this so that it is liturgically accurate. So it does become a didactic tool. Um, but it's always a little jarring for me to see something that becomes almost sanitized in its presentation, which has to be because of the museum context, um, against you know these these kinds of layered uh, presentations that we find in the field, so to speak. And this is where Gonkar Gatsa's work becomes so interesting for us. He is at once in a conversation with the museum, but also with real life functioning shrines in Tibet and outside of Tibet in China. Um, and so I just wanna be sure that I'm not missing any important points here. Um, so, he combines in this installation, as you can see, uh, it's called Buddha's Picnic. It's at Stanier Gallery at Washington and Lee University, and it's up there until March 17th, so you're welcome to come on down. Um, this, what he's doing here is an interesting combination of things. So he's looking at the shrine, at the kind of altar space here where you might find offerings. Um, here, what you don't have is the soundscape that's included in this installation. So he has layers of mantras and Buddhist teachings and songs that are going all dissonant, all going at the same time, which is pretty fabulous. So you walk in and you don't see this initially. You see the green astroturf, you walk in and you're just hit with these sounds. And then you turn the corner and you see all that's before you. He's combining the altar, the sacred space of the shrine with a very secular fun space of a picnic, something that is a very important thing in, in Tibetan culture, whether Buddhist or Bon, anything. Uh, the picnic is a wonderful liminal, we would say, space where people come together in the warmer months. Um, they are eating and drinking and 
and telling stories and playing music and playing games. And so he very intentionally created this kind of environment, right? And there he is with students um, playing, teaching them mahjong, actually. And the students are loving this, all students, all ages. They come here, and the invitation from Gonkar is that, yes, picnic, come here experience this space. Um, it is a haptic environment, not unlike this shrine space here, as Deborah was talking about it, you feel it. Uh, the dim light, the, the, the colors, etc. And here as well, the colorscape is quite different, of course. The environment is different, but he wants people to engage it. He wants people to be in this space, contributing to it, which also connects to the offerings. So it's not a final piece that's finished. It is still evolving. People are leaving their, their various offerings at the shrine, at the altar, and they're engaging this space. So it becomes something that's happening over the long durée. It's happening, it's unfolding, it's being created currently, which is so fascinating because that is the shrine. It happens over generations of engagement and interaction. People leave things, things are taken away. So in that way, he gets the real, he's, he's showing that spirit here of the shrine and the altar space. Um, he is also, as you can tell, creating this incredible mashup of imagery, right? So it's not just sacred. He is, in fact, bringing in the political, soccer players, the secular, the commercial, as we can see here with forms of little guys la, that look a lot like My Pretty Pony, um, and then this Tibetan nomadic figurine here, so jolly, making an offering of katas. He's looking at the commodification of culture. He's in including that, um, and also making this a sort of fun but very thoughtful engagement where people, ah, right, exactly, and, and at the back of the shrine, this is uh, especially interesting, you see that circle where he includes a hidden picture of the Dalai Lama, and, and I'll let Gongarla talk about what that means. So there are multiple layers of images here um, to create a real dissonance I mean, it does, it's it dissonance in the sound, but also in the imagery. And I, that's very purposeful. In my mind, he's one of the few Tibetan artists who is very willing and capably embracing the dissonance that we see in real culture, Tibetan culture today, where you've got uh, all of these different images, the political, the secular, the sacred, pulled together, and um, it's, it's an embrace of the heterotopic reality of what Tibet is, as opposed to perpetuating the idea of a utopian, pre-modern Tibet. He's bringing us into the contemporary, contemporary real world and showing us what, um, what people are dealing with, the choices that they're making. So I think with that, I'll end so that Gunkar can, um, can do his thing. <laughs> Oops, I'm sorry. And, uh, also, thanks for uh, the curator. Uh, is that Deborah? Yes, uh, bring me here and uh, uh, so, uh, I think, as Melissa mentioned, we have this uh, project started two years ago, and uh, uh, when, when uh, they propose uh, uh, this project, I should react to uh, traditional shrines such as like this one, or we will see in a gallery. Uh, so that was one of my challenges. And uh, then also, it was a, uh, I have a difficulty when I'm facing this because uh, mm, first, I, I have a very limited knowledge of a shrine uh, because I was born in the 60s and then 70s, 80s. Uh, there is 
in my grow up, there is no religious uh, uh, existence. And uh, then I came across, I think Shen was much, much later, probably when I was late 20s. And uh, I, then also, I think one of the challenging is how, how can I uh, uh, interpret interp or make that traditional very substantial and also for me it's very dominant structure and the construction into my own work. And uh, because as uh, probably some of you know, my work is uh, being uh, quite a, because that's the one of the thing I always take approach to my work is more kind of playful, but at the same time, I do, I do use the traditional form, which is I quite often use the Buddha. But for me, I think the form is just form, and but uh, uh, then I borrow that form then to 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 express what I my view and my 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 thinking, and uh, uh, then also I think one of the thing uh, is I want to the Buddha shape being more accessible for, for the people, especially uh, last 20 years I've been living in the West, then I think quite often one of the questions people always ask is about uh, uh, this, you know, uh, the connection between Buddha and themselves, because uh, 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 some people they find a little too, too far that image they can't really relate to themselves. So that was one of the, my challenging. And uh, so when I came across this project, then my thinking was uh, how can I uh, make that happen to, to the practice I did, I did and also make it more uh, accessible and also at the same time make it fun uh, for, for uh, first for myself, then probably for, for the people going to come look at the show. And uh, then I started doing some research uh, in the internet. Uh, then I came across this image, uh, which is really, uh, really inspired me. And uh, that was, a, it's a picture of a very simple shrine, but in a grassland. And uh, then I thought that this is something probably could be really interesting to explore. And later, then there is, of course, I've, then later I found more images of uh, a, a people uh, uh, picnic, but at the same time they bring the shrine with them uh, in a picnic. Then it's kind of very simple, but I should say probably quite meaningful for the people. Uh, uh, but I see the sort of this, you know, the, 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 the easy access and also this quick, quick fixing of uh, one shrine, because you can see all those shrines, it's very kind of simple. Uh, and uh, so then I came up the idea of proposing to the to the to the gallery and the university say that's probably something I want to go for it and uh, then really it started from that uh, that point then the more I looking into it then I notice uh, the shrine as Melissa just mentioned it's really evolved uh, and uh, especially in the last probably uh, 20 uh, years uh, in probably not just in China, but probably also in India or in the West. Basically, I think uh, it, there is a huge market of providing all kinds of materials for the shrine to, to get access. And 
because that bring a memory of when I first encountered with Shuang with my grandmother, that was uh, probably uh, late 80s. I mean, those days, to, to build a little shrine, it would take months of effort. But right, right now, actually, in, in, you, can, you can build a shrine probably in uh, one day. Uh, you just have to go, go to those places to, 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 to get images and to get a ready-made tankas and also ready-made object. Uh, so there is a kind of this uh, easy access quick and also instant. I mean, uh, that's something I, I, I find it very, very interesting. Then sometimes you don't even need to wait for the images. You just go to, the, go to those lab. They can, they can do it very quick for you. And then through that, then you will see more of those very quickly uh, set up a shrine. And uh, a very colorful, uh, I mean, sometimes I, I even say it's look very tacky. Uh, then, then also I think it does uh, bring a lot of uh, individual people's interest. Uh, uh, to to the shrine. Uh, so there is quite a few very the shrine quick shrine. I I came across. Then also uh, one of the thing uh, nowadays you know the shrine uh, the battle lamp. Uh, even the mantras, you don't really need a real person to do it. Actually, a lot of them being recorded into the battle lamp and, the, and the, even those flashing Buddhas. So when you just connect, the, connect to the power and the press, the press to go, then they will sing all kinds of uh, mantras and the songs. Uh, that's also bring to why that happened, I think. Uh, because Two years ago, I moved to move back to uh, to China. Uh, my my plan was going back to Lhasa, but right now, uh, me and my family live in Chengdu. Uh, so sometimes we do get access to to the Tibetan area. One thing I think what's happening in Tibet or the Tibetan areas. I mean, there is a huge booming of Tibetan Buddhisms. Uh, loads of uh, new monasteries being built or, 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 or renovate the old one, such as like this, then it come across with also huge inside uh, decorations. The one thing I noticed, I think uh, even the, 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 the shrine plus, I think that the, even the, uh, the, the monastery settings, I think, become more a dynamic, and uh, so there is a kind of interconnection between where it's situated. For instance, I think those pillows you can see actually it's not anymore the Tibetan monastery pillow used to be. So it's much more Chinese influence. Uh, so there is a, this kind of creative thinking and also very kind of uh, free. So there is a kind of more, more, more taking taking a, 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 how do you call it? Yes, free, free thinking activities. I mean, for instance, this is the one of the street lamp in one of the Tibetan areas. So they also try to make it uh, looks like lotus flowers and uh, with Chinese lantern. So you will see that pretty much everywhere in Tibetan area. And then the, 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 the prayer flags, uh, it's very religious and holy, uh, holy object, but now people start using that to promote their own areas or even promote commercial interest, even culture actually, contemporary culture. And then, of course, those are some of the uh, design I came across. Uh, it's by young, I, I presume it's a young Tibetan. So you can see they also borrow, 
borrow a, a traditional image, but uh, give a kind of modern twist. So I, the reason I'm showing those, I think somehow I feel it's kind of connected to what's really happening with the evolving of the shrine, because also uh, there is a, there is a more more of young 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 Tibetan or even young Chinese uh, become a, a Buddhist or, or interested in Buddhist, but I think for them probably maybe the traditional settings. Uh, not quite uh, enough uh, space or free thinking. So that's kind of the connection I find. Then, of course, the fashion. Uh, young Tibetans are really try to adapt into the, the... I mean, they try to catch the essence of the Tibetan culture, but at the same time try to uh, mixing with, uh, with either Chinese or, or Western style. So there is a kind of modeling, wearing, uh, being adapted tuba, which is, you can see, quite a Chinese influence in it. And uh, uh, so there is a lot of those things you can really uh, see uh, when I'm there. Then so it's a quite a fascinating, uh, even for myself, and even some of the advertisement for carpets. So they are, they, they, they're using kind of new way of uh, uh, promoting the carpet. Uh, then also, I think there is a kind of boom of uh, 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 remaking Tibetan images into the contemporary, uh, even culture or commercial uh, or creativities. For instance, there's uh, uh, because in China. Uh, the WeChat is very popular uh, as a, one of the social social network uh, thing. Then, quite often, the image is very important uh, to to express your your happiness or your sadness. So, this is one of the uh, attempt to create uh, Tibetan images show express unhappy or sad or angry. Uh, so, there is a there is a huge kind of image making pushing that into kind of mainstream. Uh, when I'm saying mainstream, actually it's a, more like the mainstream of Chinese market or the uh, mainstream Chinese culture. So they, I think the youngsters not a, uh, doesn't want to really make themselves too, I don't know is the right word, so too minority. They want to uh, be a minority, but at the same time also try to, try to, try to get into the mainstream. Uh, so there are some cartoon images. You can see the 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 the, the, the Tibetans, uh, not the Tibetan probably we used to think. And uh, but it's a, but uh, the youngsters, especially the Chinese, they they like that. So I think that's that's what they try to push the culture into more that direction. Uh, then there is also attempt to use uh, Western popular. I think that's one of the Canadian from 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 London. So uh, there is kind of this, you know, creativity. Then last, I think we have uh, uh, the the person Obama was wearing a Tibetan tuba and the saluting. Uh, so ah. Uh, so I just want to kind of showing what's really happening there during my two years and the showing to, to, to you guys, you know, this kind of evolving, uh, very kind of vibrant creative creativity and the free thinking. And then those are really through when I started with this project. And uh, I, so it's, it's, a, it's a quite a fascinating. And uh, thank you, I think that's it. <laughs> Thanks.
both of you were addressing directly or indirectly the theme about um, how the shrine has evolved in contemporary life. I'm assuming that's what you were talking about. And <clears throat> if, if I heard you correctly, you were referring to part of the reason for it coming from the lack of access to some of the traditional shrines, perhaps, or temples in Lhasa and other places like that. So um, does that also, with it, connote the fact that there's been a loss of some of the original Tibetan Buddhist teachings and practices, and they're sort of reforming in a kind of contemporary, contextual way that's not necessarily in a traditional, what you would associate with Tibetan Buddhism? Uh, is this sort of creating a subcategory of Tibetan Buddhism in, in what you've seen? I'm, I'm curious about the whole effect here of the, on the society. Uh, actually, I think maybe I didn't uh, express clearly. Uh, I think that uh, this creativity and also that the evolving of the shrine, uh, it's, a, it's not a, because the lack of get access to see the traditional one, because, uh, 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 you, because my works involving with that project, so I didn't include those uh, traditional shrine picture in my, in my PowerPoint. Actually, in, I think, uh, be fair, I think in Tibet, even the, the area, uh, the Tibetan area in China I, I went to last summer, there is still huge amount of uh, uh, traditional shrine. I think youngster can get access and also uh, go to the monastery to see it. But I think uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, uh, the youngster is, seems, seems to want more, uh, uh, yes, they are interested in Buddhism, but they also want to make a mark of this themselves into this practice. So, I mean, for instance, they have a, uh, they always have their favorite favorite things in the shrine, like football or film star, and uh, or, or or cartoon characters. Uh, so that's I just need to clear for that one. Um, to that, I would just add, in some way, I think we're both looking at um, shrines in the age of mechanical reproduction, right? To take the title of uh, Walter Benjamin's very famous article. Um, and I, so I really do think that there's, um, the tradition may not necessarily be lost. I mean, some of that is happening, certainly because of the political situation. Um, so I'm not denying that, but I think what we're looking at is a very interesting creative uh, transformation of some traditions into uh, and mechanizing them. So mechanizing the mantras, um, mechanizing the uh, butter lamps, making them electric. Um, and this has been a slow but consistent process, um, and certainly one that, that Gonkar can attest to, you know, that sort of living through the late 1980s, and this is actually a question I have for you, um, when he mentioned that he was helping his grandmother make a shrine in the 1980s, um, and, and how that took a considerable amount of time. And now, if you look and see where things are at this point, he, he's come up with this phrase of an insta-shrine, right? Something that can be instantly made within a day. Um, so I think that's where we are. I think it has a lot to do with mechani mechanization um, and transforming practices and translating them into a mechanical world in some interesting way. Um, but I, I won't ask my question because I'm sure other people have other. I, I find it fascinating, uh, the idea that you, for lack of a better phrase, these pop-up shrines, a picnic yeah. that suddenly becomes a, a, a shrine in a sacred space or a, a shrine that pops up in the middle of a field somewhere and, and creates this sort of sacred uh, image within from out of nothing, kind of going back to, to your point that you just made. But are these uh, shrines, are they meant to be temporary? 
the, the idea of that oh, you have a picnic or that something pops up somewhere as a shrine, is, that, is, is it something that in, in modernity and in the diaspora that's not to take on the same feeling of, of what had uh, occurred in Tibet decades ago as a permanent shrine but is meant to be extra, extemporaneous and, and, and momentary? I, I mean, probably, I think those academic probably has to look into it. But my, my impression is, uh, mm, uh, because as I showed a couple of pictures, uh, because the place, the city I live in, Chengdu, they have a quite a big size of Tibetan community. And then there's uh, loads of shops selling all kinds of Buddhist objects. And uh, so I think uh, that kind of provide a, provide a kind of easy access to, to build a shrine. And then also probably when people go to picnic, I mean, as you know, the Tibetan picnic is not just one day, especially for the nomads, probably it will be last probably two, three weeks or the whole summer. So it is temporary, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's something. Then also I like the idea of removing the shrine from, from indoor to outdoor and also removing that from, uh, from, from existing space. That's kind of the, the creativity. I find it very interesting, yeah. I also think of a really long-standing Tibetan Buddhist tradition of portable shrines, of carrying your own shrine with you. So there are some of those, for example, in the shrine room, the Kendall shrine room, in Encountering the Buddha. And they can range from you know, this small to, to you know, a foot square, so that um, when nomads move, they carried on their bodies their shrines. Other questions? I have a question for Gonkar. Despite the fact that we talk all the time about shrines, <laughs> all of a sudden, it, this is a lingering question um, that's been there and I just haven't asked you about. What could, uh, so you grew up in Plaza, um, went to school in Beijing, then came back to Plaza, and you talk about this period in the late 80s, which is, I think, also when Ding Xiaoping had more control, it was a more open time. Um, is that why you were able to work with your grandmother to make a shrine? Could you talk about that a little bit? So before that point, there wasn't a shrine in your house or in her house? Yeah. So I'm just curious if you could flesh that out a little. Sure. Uh, yes, I, I mean, uh, yep, I think I, uh, I mean, during my whole upbringing uh, in the late 60s and the whole 70s and even early 80s, uh, even in Tibet, in Lhasa, uh, the, the whole B Buddhist practice is being, uh, being, being banned. So I really grew up uh, with not knowing all those things. And uh, then on my surprise, I uh, mid 80 or early 80, I went to study in Beijing for my art. When I came back, that was the first time I saw my grandmother was uh, practicing. Uh, a, I mean, that was the first time I saw butter lamps and uh, simple shrine and the Buddha pictures in my house. Uh, then, then later. Uh, the, the people starting uh, building a shrine in their house. And uh, then I was involved with my, my ground, helping her to build the first shrine. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it was a, a, those days, I mean, there is no shop. Uh, there is no, uh, the one we just saw in the picture exist in Lhasa. So, each pieces, uh, the, the images, the, the butter lamps, and even the shrine, you have to really go to the special tea people 
to commission them, then you have to wait for weeks, weeks. So it was, a, it was quite a long, long process. And uh, then, then also my, I think, impression was uh, the whole, whole structure, uh, whole requirement also, also was very rigid because you can't really put anything else than, uh, than the, 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 the certain images and, and also the also the step. So it was a, it was a kind of long yeah, process, yeah. yeah. So my question is, what do you see are some of the reasons for the resurgence of Buddhism? Because I think you said there's a boom in Buddhism now. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a, that was a really uh, the, the experience and also I witnessed during my time last two years in China uh, even I went to Lhasa. Uh, when I say boom, means uh, except the except the Tibetan. Now a lot of the uh, Chinese and the middle-aged Chinese, and also especially a lot of young Chinese are uh, uh, even educated Chinese are really into Tibetan Buddhism, or they are really interested about Tibet. Uh, I mean. Mm, Probably early 80s or 90s, even uh, when you when you met a Chinese, then if you say you are from Tibet, they always will have a say. Gosh, that's going to be it's going to be very. It was they will say it's very harsh place, so quite a backwards place, and uh, uh, but but now I think that attitude is totally changed. I mean, when when I say um, my, I'm originally from Tibet, then they will say, oh, that's the place I really want to go. And uh, I, so there is a, this fascinating kind of uh, shift of attitude towards the Tibetan and also Tibetan Buddhism. I mean, that's why we came across so many building sites of Buddha uh, te temples and uh, Buddha statues, and uh, then the, the market selling those Buddha objects in Chengdu is flourishing. It's a, yes. Yeah, I have a comment and a question. Uh, first of all, I wanted to <coughs> compliment the whole presentation. It's really very informative and thought-provoking, unlike anything I, I've experienced in a gallery or museum setting. Um, and now, now the question, which is really uh, what provoked my asking for the microphone. Um, I think, Melissa, you showed a picture of a, a shrine in Ireland and then a shrine in uh, Himalaya somewhere. So I guess the, the question that that prompts is we're seeing you know, longstanding sacred spaces and then pop-up shrines and instant sacred spaces. Uh, just to the whole group, is there any uh, feeling or could you comment on any interconnectivity, any uh, power or universal interconnectivity between these diverse sacred spaces? So um, I think there is. I think um, you know, there are certain trends in research that um, there, there was a period, I guess, in the 80s where somebody at the University of Chicago named Eliade, his last name, he was so interested in finding these broad connections among the different religions, and he was amazing at it. So he would look at concepts like uh, thresholds or, I don't know, other things along those lines. Um, since that point, um, there has been a move towards really analyzing in a really granular way speci your specific focus. So don't, don't pull out and be too broad because no one wants to make erroneous uh, points about too many religions. So I think um, the, the way I'm answering your question is to say, I do believe there is. I do believe that the, the impulse to mark space in a spontaneous or in a more constructed way to say this is where there can be a communication between divinity and humanity. I feel that that is world over. And 
religion, across religions. I think that there's um, a tendency now in academia to be very careful to study something like that on a grand scale. So that's why you'll get these sort of micro studies in say Tibetan Buddhism or even the Bund tradition or in Islam. Uh, there, Christy Gruber is, is, has looked at um, Iranian, Persian shrine, uh, shrine constructions. So um, it's a, I'm being a little tedious here, but I definitely agree with you. I know, I, I can feel what you're feeling in these pictures, and, uh, but there hasn't been a ton of work on that. Though I'm actually interested in doing a, a little bit of a conference along those lines of having uh, material culture and shrines. Um, which is you know, pan-Asian and over some 1,500 years, that for all of the scholars, the three of us working on the labels, it was, it was a challenge. It was a fascinating and great challenge to talk about Buddhism on that scale because we've all been trained. We all come out of that era of very granular, specific studies. So we did things like we tried to do it. Um, we did do it without mentioning specific Buddhist schools but looked for commonalities and tried to be local, but look for ground. So that, that was mind-bending for us working on it. So perhaps there is a shift, in the f a shift in the field now to look for more profound or broader connections. ask a question on what is you know the, the so what in this um, you know for those of uh, those of us who are ignorant you know to um, you know to the religion and and ultimately what you guys are working on you know why you know why should the average person you know care about this if that makes sense yes and, um, and not trying to be offensive in the question but generally so I didn't get the question part of it but I certainly got your observation that it, uh -huh. Do, do, do you want a response? Yeah, could you repeat it? Uh, Grace, could you, did you hear it? Could you repeat it? Just speak into the mic. Yeah, sorry. No, no, okay. So Is that better? Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, so somebody who's um, just generally ignorant to, you know, to the religion and that particular culture, you know, as a, an average person, American sitting here listening in on this, what is the, you know, the so what or the why, you know, should we, you know, care about what's going on with this um, transition? Um, I think there several people have asked Gonkar something similar. What, and so I'll, I'll ask you that. What, what do you wish people to take away from the installation experience? Uh, well, I, I would just say have a fun, I think. I mean, that's what a... a, a I, I like the idea of uh, the associate, especially for this project, the associate the, the, the shrine with the picnic. And uh, I, uh, also, I, 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 that, that was kind of my attempt for my practice for the last uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, I really want to uh, uh, make a, a, the, the uh, kind of uh, re reinterpretation of uh, this, you know, religious image into contemporary setting, and even even the, the environment I live, because I live in London for many years, and, and later moved to New York, now moved to move back to China. So I think each move does uh, inspire my work, but I think I still want to. Maybe I can't say I want. Somehow I can't really get away from this uh, the image of uh, uh, image which is associated with uh, my own tradition. But that's okay. I don't have a problem with that. I think what I really want to do is uh, I don't want my painting become a, a religious painting or or. Or, 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 or even say political. I mean, I just want to make uh, something uh, to express my own observation 
to the place I live or, or, or the next. Uh, so right now I'm also concentrated, not a concentrated, I'm starting doing my uh, kind of uh, observation of, uh, of, of China uh, because we, we all know there is a huge change and uh, that's why I moved back. I want to really be there and witness change and then maybe one day uh, try to bring it into my work. Uh. Okay, I think we have time for one last question and we have one question in the back here. So, um, just as an artist, you have worked two-dimensionally, you've worked three-dimensionally in installation. Um, you use a lot of everyday objects or sort of images drawn from popular culture and your cultural environment. So, just out of curiosity, looking anywhere, uh, anywhere in the world, what are the other perhaps artists or works that uh, you look at perhaps? And um, you started to talk a little bit about what you're looking at now. Um, if I may ask, what's in the future? What future projects are perhaps brewing? <laughs> uh, I think, as I just mentioned, actually I, I moved back to China and then last two years actually I did a I think this is the, probably the second uh, a kind of medium-sized project I did. And uh, then the last one was big, uh, a, not a big, I think medium-sized of uh, a photo uh, installation, which is called a, a family album. Uh, I was using my family to, to look, to, to, to explore, Maybe not explore. I think kind of uh, try to try to show outside world. You know the the Tibetan living uh, in China, uh, how 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 they, uh, I mean how's their life or how's their view everything. Then that's what through my family's uh, photograph. Then this is the second project. Then even though it's shrine, but I think. Uh, Subtly, I still wanted to show my observation about, uh, about, about, about China and Tibet. And uh, uh, then it's a quite a, quite a uh, delicate, I think. Uh, there is kind of balance I have to, I have to keep. And uh, then I'm, I'm still new in China, even though that's kind of ironic. Actually, uh, 20 years ago, I, I left there but this time when I went back, I feel like I'm being in a new place. So I'm still exploring, so I need more time. Probably maybe in a few years time, I might have some answers, I guess, or maybe never had an answer. So I'm, I'm just doing my, yes. Uh, also, I think I, I really want to go home, yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's kind of mean aim, yeah. Well. Um, great discussion. Thank you both, and thank you all for coming today.